Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church, the family of God. Good to be with you. Special welcome to anyone who might be visiting with us first time. We're grateful to have you here to, to be with us and to worship our God together. My name is Ken Murphy. I'm one of the pastors here at this church, and we desire that Sundays are the corporate gathering of the body of believers for the purpose of worshiping our God together in spirit and in truth. So I'm glad you have joined us for that great end. This morning, we're going to worship him from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through probably 15. Uh, verse 15 has really become a life verse for me, and I, I, I think it's the whole Bible maybe in, in one little verse, so I hope that you will be blessed as we look at it. And then we're going to sit here shoulder to shoulder and remember together the Lord's table, uh, our Lord and Savior who gave himself for us, and we will remember that body that was broken and the blood that was spilled out for our redemption. And I mean, to think some people are out golfing this morning when you could be doing this. What is wrong? We call that total depravity. So... <clears throat> Let's go before our God and pray and ask him to bless our time in worship. Father, I come before you and I thank you for what the table that is set before us at the Lord's table and in the word of God this morning. And I pray that by your spirit, you would bring blessing to every mind and heart that is believing here this morning. God, we have been learning about the means of grace and we desire to not just go through them, but to meet you to know you, to love you, to understand you better, to walk with you. And so I pray that you would use this means this morning, the word of God, to show us something beautiful that is life-changing if we could lay hold of it. I just, I just pray that you would meet us this morning in a very special way. And it's in Christ's name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Romans chapter 8. I want to give you kind of a bird's eye view again of this chapter because some cotton-headed ninny muggins has taken so long to get through it. So I don't want you to lose the forest for the trees. Chapter 8, the Holy Spirit's mentioned 17 times. There's some debate, small s, big s, and the Greek doesn't tell you. So how many times he's referred to, but I'm going with 17. And the Holy Spirit is allowing us to see his role in the new covenant in this chapter. And in his role is to point to Christ and to show him so that just the humility of the Spirit to even let us look in and see and understand what he does, what the work of Christ has purchased for us. <laughs> and so the focus of chapter 8 is on the Spirit of God. But it's narrowing in on this very special thing that the Spirit does in our lives as children of God. In Romans 8.16, Paul says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. He, he, he bears witness with our spirit that we're sons and daughters of God. And that, that's big. This is the Holy Spirit himself going right into our hearts to give us assurance. And the spirit will show us that we really belong to God. These promises are ours. They're not far off. They're, they're Gentiles who have been brought near now through the blood of Christ. And so many things are going to attack this assurance. You got your own flesh. We've been learning about remaining sin that's going to cause you to sin and make you doubt and struggle and wonder. You have a world, he's going to tell us, that's full of futility. And as you look at it, you're going to be like, is God's kingdom even advancing? And you have a devil at the end of this chapter who will bring a charge against God's elect and he will use human instruments in that as well. In Romans 8, 28, he says there'll be trials that will come into our lives that are going to be really hard. So much fights against our assurance, does it not? And so I need something more than he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. I need something bigger than that. I need something more than just a logical equation that if I believe and Jesus did this, that I'm saved. I, I just believe that. I need something more than just a doctrinal grit. I need kind of more like what verse 16 is saying. The Spirit's going to testify with your spirit that you're children of God. I need chapter 8 verse 15 that he's going to cause your heart to cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. I need Romans 8, 28 that we know and that Greek word for know is experientially. 
I, I know that God causes all things to work together for good. And I need the close of this chapter that I'm convinced that neither death nor life will be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I, I need foundation and, and strength to this assurance. And so this section we just finished, we've seen that it's by the Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the body. And if you do this, Paul says you will live. Now in verse 14, he says, these are the sons of God who do this. <clears throat> the main thing in this chapter is that the Holy Spirit will assure you in verse 1 that right now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and that nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing. His love, Abba, that you are a child of God. That's what the Spirit is working and doing in our lives in this chapter. That is what, what is hurting every one of us here this morning. Every struggle that you have, everything that you're battling, has at the very core of it, you need to know you're a child of God. Deep from within your soul is an irrepressible cry, Abba. And what this could do for your soul this morning, what this would do in your killing of sin that we studied the last three weeks, nothing that sin offers could ever be as comforting as Abba. All that this would do to keep the requirement of the law to love God and love others when you know that you're a child of God. That's what this section is all about. If you look with me in verse 14, he says he testifies that you are sons of God. In verse 15, he, he, he speaks adoption and you cry out, Abba. In verse 16, he says, we are the children of God. And in verse 17, if children, then heirs of God. So even a dense guy like me can't miss what this section is about. I hope you're seeing it jump off the pages. I want you to see that God does not want us to live in the courtroom the rest of our days. We have spent two years looking at the declaration in the courtroom that you're justified. God himself has declared you not guilty by the work of Jesus Christ. You are now declared righteous by God. We're released from prison. We walk out new men and women for sure, but we walk out with a whole new status. Judges declare us not guilty. Judges don't adopt formal, former criminals into their home, into their family. Come, come, be a part of my family. I'll give you everything that I have. Children of God, you have peace with God. We saw that in Romans 5.1. You stand in grace. But the one we have peace with, the one who has grace toward us, is now our Father. God has given His Spirit so that we would know this from the depth of our hearts. I'm going to give you your Spirit. I want you to know this. I want you to live into it and treasure it and live your life on this truth. God's our Father. Don't live in courtrooms. Come out from it justified to be children of God. That's where God's moving and leading this section. God has given his spirit so that we could know this. And I'm going to pray one more time, and then we're going to break open this text. Father, I come before you. I love this flock with passion. And there are many who sit here that need to be set free this morning. They're still living like slaves. They're still living under fear. But God, this truth could set so many free, could give life to their mortification of sin. God, I, I pray that only you can do this by your spirit, that today, that whatever is deceiving them in their minds and unbelief and all that they're battling, God, I just want shackles and chains and unbelief to fall off and spirit to speak in the core of their being. Abba. God, that's my prayer. That's what I want for this flock. Would you hear our prayer and our cry this morning? Amen. We are children of God. Before we jump into our text this morning, 
I, I don't want to move by that quickly. This is profound and a breathtaking statement. Thus, the enemy's desire is to take such a truth away from you. For 200 years, there's been so much teaching in our land that everybody's a son of God. And not in the sense that we're going to look at this morning. You must be born again to become children of God. You must be adopted by God through the blood bought redemption of his son. And so this title, Sons of God, is so big. And in the 19th century, the world was getting smaller, and there became such a fascination with comparative religion. And if you read any German theology, you would hear this word, Watson, which means being or essence of things. And it was like the lowest common denominator, this essential kernel of truth that all the religions have, and we're trying to boil it down and get that. And a guy named Adolf von Karnak, uh, if you're German, I butchered that, but it's all right. Uh, he wrote a book called The Vossen of Christianity. And his two points are the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. That we've been basically reared on this kind of modern day thinking in our world. And they prove it by Acts 17, 28, where Paul said, In him, God, we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. And so we would all agree there's a sense that all human beings are brothers and sisters created by one God, image bearers of God. But that can't be confused with what we're going to look at this morning. That's what I want to make sure, this phileo, love, agape relationship that this verse is talking about. This relationship is between God and his redeemed. The universal fatherhood is not the way sons of God is used in the scriptures. For our verse in verse 14, for all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so this is the only, this, this is bread for spiritual children alone. <clears throat> so we can't cheapen what is before us this morning, say this is universal and it's special for all people. We need to live into the reality of what this means. And I just want to start with you hearing Christians only are the sons and daughters of God. This is, you must be born again into this status that we look at. <clears throat> so here's your outline for this morning. Paul's going to give us four ways that the Holy Spirit shows us that we're children of God. And I got a little bit of bad news out of the gate, but then a whole lot of good news. The bad news is we're going to get through two points and I'm going on vacation for two weeks. So you got to wait two more weeks. To hear the second two points. The good points is these first two points are so good, you're going to be glad you were here. So the first point, <coughs> he leadeth me, and then he frees me, he assures me, and he rewards me. But first, verse 14 is where we left off last week. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And so uh, let's begin in verse 14 with four. And I've told you this a lot of times, you don't start sentences with four. That's not it. So it's, it's an explanation. He's still explaining what we've been looking at for the last three weeks. Paul is now continuing his thought, giving more explanation to it. <clears throat> this is going to be really important as we try to understand what does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God? There are so many answers out there. I was blown away by what all has been written on how to be led by the Spirit of God in the church. And very few held to this four. They just drop it. And the four is the whole explanation of what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. And if we do, if we hold on to our four, we're going to get some great insight onto how the Spirit leads us and what He leads us into. So what did we look at for three weeks? Three weeks in verses 12 through 13 that we're not debtors to the flesh any longer. And if we are, He says, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, he says you'll live. And we spent a whole sermon showing that that's not legalism and what that means. You can go back to last week if you want to hear that. But verse 14 then, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And so there's some really big connections going on here. First, putting to death the deeds of the body is, is being compared to being led by the Spirit of God. And then he says, you will live, and that's being connected in verse 14 with, you are the sons of God. And so I want to try to make these connections this morning. 
Uh, when we do something by the Spirit, like mortification of sin, we're being led by the Spirit. Remember, we've been looking at by the Spirit. He's going to flush that out. You do this when you are led by the Spirit. And I love all the phrases, led, filled, walk, such beautiful terms. The Spirit is the one leading us into action to put sin to death. That kind of activity in heart only comes from one place. I want you to catch that. It comes from the Holy Spirit within us. So how do I know if I'm a son or daughter of God this morning? These are the sons of God. It's in what's called the indicative, a statement of fact. If you are led by the Spirit, it's a fact. You are a son or daughter of God. And so if I'm led by the Spirit, what am I led into? What is he leading me into? Well, he's leading me to put to death the deeds of the body. I'm led by him into battle. And this word led, I just love it. It's the whole new covenant in one little word. I want you to notice it doesn't say we're driven. We're forced. We're made to quiver. We're shoved. We're manipulated. We're, we're not just commanded and bark out orders like a slave master. Do this, do that. But remember back to Romans 7, 6. But now we have been released from the law because of Jesus fulfilling it in our place. <clears throat> Having died to that by which we were bound so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Well, Christianity is I'm going to go on the inside. I'm going to put my law within your heart. So now you desire and want to do what's right. In those days, I'm going to make a new covenant, God says, and I'll take my law and I'll write it on your hearts and I'll put it in your minds. I will make your heart mine and your will, and you'll want to do the things that are pleasing to God. That's the whole new covenant. Um, you will now be led by the Spirit who indwells you. And what will He lead you in? To hate what your Father in heaven hates. To love what your Father in heaven loves. He will lead you to put to death sin. The Spirit is within you. You're not bedfellows with sin. You're not friends with it any longer. Southside Bible Church. We have the Spirit of God leading us into this holy war against sin. And by Him, He's putting to death the deeds in our body that still remain. And as we read this word, the Bible, and learn it, and, I, and what we've been looking at is believe it, he's going to be putting to death the deeds of the body. This morning, he works in our hearts to help us believe it, to assure us that the promises are ours. To, to, to put sin to death, I need to know that I'm a child of God, and these are my promises. So he gives you a Holy Spirit to assure you, God is our Father. His son's inheritance is ours. We're joint heirs with Christ. I don't have to get it all now. I got everything in Christ. I, I'm going to make Bill Gates look like a pauper one day. So how can I know I'm a child of God? From my soul, I fight against sin because it's against God and him only and he's my father. That's how I know. And I want you to hear the word fight and not perfection. So I'm not talking about perfection. That's heaven. But there's a, a new war that starts the minute you're born again. And now with the spirit within me, I hate sin because I love God. I'm going to battle. I'm going to fight. I'm going to lose some battles. But this Romans 8 says I'm going to win the war. I got to get that. And so as you're seeking assurance, I got a question for you. How do you feel about your sin? I have a lot of people wanting assurance who love their sin. It's not a good marriage. What is your attitude towards it? Are you cavalier? Nonchalant? Let me just sin that grace might abound? Surely God's big enough to not get worked up over all my sin. I'm just going to manage it as we talked about. I'm not going to let God dictate my sex life. I'm going to use my money however I want. 
If you saw the way my wife treated me, you would understand why I'm not nurturing. You ever try to nurture a porcupine? I'm going to date him. He said he believed there was a God and he went to church when he was four. I want you to hear this this morning. Being led by the Spirit of God is being led into an all-out war against sin. Those are the sons of God. This is what the Spirit is leading you into, a life of holiness. This is why you can never find true peace anymore in your sin. You can't find it. I, I, I just, I get tempted and I do dumb things, but I never can find peace in sin any longer. Lord, wake me up to be led by the Spirit of God. And it, it's a passive voice that we're being acted upon. The Spirit is leading us into killing this sin. The Holy Spirit is causing you to put to death the deeds of your body. John Murray, the great commentator, said the activity of the believer is the evidence of the Spirit's activity within him. And the activity of the Spirit is the cause of the believer's activity. What a beautiful little synergism going on here. And so I want to put sin to death by his power and his floodlight on Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that I have some of this and I want way more. But these are the sons of God who are being led by the Spirit to put sin to death. That has so much to say to our culture and our country. Is this your experience? Yeah, pastor, but it's just like a mustard seed, but I have this. And Spurgeon says, it does not say he who runs. He says, if you could walk, crawl, or use crutches, you're still being led, and these are the sons of God. Arthur Pink said this, the Spirit leads the Christian away from the vanities of the world to the satisfying delight which is to be found in the Lord. He turns us from the husks which the swine feed upon into spiritual realities, drawing our affections to the things above. He moves us to seek after more intimate and more constant communion with God, Abba, which can only be obtained by separation from that which he abhors. His aim is to conform us more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to marvel this morning. The Spirit leads me. He leads me into mortification of sin. He leads me to fight and to wage war against it. And we've learned last week by hearing and believing the Word of God. That's what the Spirit does in our lives. Second, He frees me in verse 15. For you <coughs> have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And I hope that sounds very familiar to what Sean uh, read this morning in Galatians. <clears throat> Smoke and my lungs are not a good marriage. So <laughs> keep working with me. We're going to get through this. Um, is this leading to be a drudgery? It is the, the design of the new covenant is to be your greatest pleasure. I love being led by the Spirit to fight against sin. Look how Paul is going to lead us to pure gold this morning. What, is, what does verse 15 start with? Four. And I don't know if anyone's ever told you this. You don't start a sentence with four. It's more explanation. I love we get more. So my question is, I, I want to be led by the Spirit. What does it mean to be led? How is that going to work? What is it that the Spirit will lead me into that causes me to put to death the deeds of the flesh to be specific? I want to kill sin. Spirit, what are you going to lead me into? How can I kill it? What, how are you going to help me? And the answer is four. And this four is just pure honey. It's beautiful. And I, I, I sent it in late so it didn't get to the guys in the back, but, so I'm going to have to do it with my hands. Uh, if you diagram this sentence out, it is just beautiful. So anyone who remembers from school, you get a subject, a verb, and an object. And the subject, if you look in verse 15, is you. A verb is received with this negative not. You, you have not received the object, a spirit, 
with a prepositional phrase of slavery. So you haven't received a spirit that brings you into slavery. Uh, unto, if you look at a preposition ace, it's like a circle and it means to come right into the middle. So he said, you haven't received a spirit that brings you smack dab back into the sphere of fear. Christian, you, you haven't got a spirit that brings you back into fear. We're going to flush that out. And then there's the strongest adversative, Allah, but on the complete contrary, you have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So one spirit brings you back into fear again. You're sitting here this morning, maybe even just in fear, phobia, trembling, shaking. It brings you back into fear again. And on the complete opposite, the Holy Spirit comes into your life to cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. And so before we dig into this passage, there's just one quick exegetical call and we will dig in. This, this is pure gold, this passage. So when, when you, when the, in the Greek, when it says spirit, it doesn't have a capital or lower case. You got to put it in which one it is. You have to discern by context. <laughs> so in verse 15, we got two spirits. And so it can either both be two human spirits, which means you, you, you don't have a feeling of slavery anymore, but you have a feeling of adoption. Or they could both be the Holy Spirit. You weren't given the Holy Spirit that leads you into slavery, but the Holy Spirit that leads you into Abba. Or it could be the first is a human spirit. You don't have the human spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit has come into your life crying Abba. And so I think for sure the second what spirit is the Holy Spirit because of what we read this morning, Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba, Father. And so this is the Holy Spirit coming into our very heart and it causes this cry, Abba, Father. And I think the first one is human spirit, but if it's Holy Spirit, they're going to end in the same place. Throughout Romans, Paul has shown us the spirit that ruled over us in Adam. And he says it's a spirit of bondage. It's a spirit of slavery. In Romans 8, 2, uh, the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set you free from the law of sin and of death. <clears throat> Romans 5, we were under condemnation and death. So we were held in that by the God of this world, the law and our very nature, we are, we are in this fear of death. And I, I just want to read Hebrews 2. I think it draws it out. Verse 14, since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same nature that through death he might render powerless the devil, him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and he might deliver those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. So as unbelievers, um, you spend your whole life saying, I, death, I can't hear you. Ooh, let me go to parties. Let me go to uh, vacations and let me do all these things and watch movies so I don't think about death because I, I hate it. It's a, it's a fear. I'm scared of it. And I don't, I don't want to think about it. And it was a slavery that you don't even realize that it held you all your days. You're, you're, you had this fear with everything you were doing. You always knew in the back of your mind. It was there. There was no peace. Only fear. And everything you did was out of fear. That's not the spirit that God has given to us. Children of God. We are not a people that live in the fear of death and judgment and condemnation. There's, there's right now no condemnation. Believer, please don't live under condemnation. We don't fear the past. It was paid for. And we don't fear the present because he's my God. And I don't fear the future because God's going to be in the future. So what is the cure for fear? Last year, I saw more fear than any time since I've been a believer. So much anxiety, depression, future, past. This is what really grabbed me in this passage. What is the opposite of fear? 
Abba. The opposite of fear is a perfect love that dries out all fear. And in Abba, there's a perfect love. And for any who are afraid and scared and worried, whatever you're facing this morning, the cure is not save more money, get, get a shot, you know, all the different lies. The answer is Abba. I just want to give that to you this morning. But on the complete opposite, you've received a spirit of adoption. And all I could think was the beauty of adoption. Adoption was a legal transaction where you take an orphan and you bring them into your family and they get the full rights and they get the full protections and love. And the document is signed. But what's the problem? <clears throat> the problem is the orphan can look at the paper, but they've spent their whole life, usually with great loss, hurt, self-protection, feeling unwanted and unloved, and they come into it with all of this. And sometimes a piece of paper doesn't solve it. And every time you blow it, I wonder if they're going to get rid of me. Every time you see it with paternal children, I wonder if I really do belong. And if I blow it, do they really love me? And there's this battle. It's just hard to believe that this family loves me and is going to truly bring me into the family and give me the child's inheritance. I wish I could make your spirit know it and believe it. And this is the battle with so many that I have met in my journey in faith. It is hard to believe that you're really a child of God. That's why we get Romans 8 in the Holy Spirit. Because if you did, game over. What can you do to someone who really believes they're a child of God? I've watched it. I love it as a pastor. You can do nothing to them. Nothing could touch you the rest of your days if you believed this. No sin would triumph. I think about Christ. Everything was for his father. He loved him and he never uh, doubted. And the devil came and tempted him in the wilderness and he kept trying to get him to come out and take care and protect himself since his father wouldn't. If he won't make you, feed you, turn the stone into bread, God's not going to help you. Help yourself. And it just, you couldn't get Jesus to come out from trusting his father. No temptation could get him. Why? He knows the father. He believes that he's lived it. Okay? That's the cure for all temptation. Abba. I'm a child of God. God gives us his own spirit of adoption, sent right into your very hearts and soul to dwell with us, we saw in Romans 8. And what does he do? He tells us we're adopted. He confirms and makes real the legal transaction of adoption. I've preached on justification for two years, and you could still sit here and just say, academically, I see that. I need now to move into what this is all about, to bring me near to God and to be adopted into his family and to be a child loved by God and cared for and protected and, and in his eternal family. He confirms and he makes real that legal transaction of adoption. And my question is, how does he do it? How does he do that? Well, he comes in and he just does this one thing. Abba. Abba. Father. It's an Aramaic word. And Luke he came to Jesus, teaches how to pray. And he says, you pray this way. Abba. And John 17, in that intimate moment in the upper room, he prays, Abba. And it means father in the Aramaic. And yet this is true in every language and every culture that I've ever studied. There is a, a name of a parent that a, a toddler, a little child has for their parents. And it's always a syllable that you don't need any teeth to say it because you can't. My, my favorite thing is when the little kids come up in church and they smile and they're missing those two front teeth. And I, every time, I'm, I'm just so predictable. Can you say Mississippi? And they go, Mississippi. And I, I don't know why I get so much joy out of that. I just like, <laughs> that is so cute. But in every culture, it's mama, papa, abba. 
A mentor of mine once said that in every human being, at the earliest stages, we reach out to someone who's Abba. They love us, they're powerful, and they take care of us. They're never going to let us down. Abba, Mama, it's just so beautiful. And we all grabbed onto a human being. And you know what? They all let us down. No person can fulfill Abba. We all want someone who will never let us down. Someone who will always be there and who will love us unconditionally. And my children reached out for me and said, Dada. And I can't tell you what that did to my heart. But they never found the desire of their heart in me because we're made in the image of God and every one of us are crying for Abba. If you're an unbeliever here today, that's what you're looking for. Your heart's crying for what you've been made for, Abba, Daddy. Some spend their whole life trying to find it in some person. And the Spirit is telling you where to find it. What Paul is telling us here this morning is God sends his spirit within us and we say, Abba. To the, to the creator of the universe, Abba. We can take hold of God with all the intimacy that a young child takes hold of their mother or father. And, and you know I'm going to use these illustrations all the time now, but I'm a grandpa. <laughs> and I didn't know how much joy I would have watching this little girl look at her daddy and the way she smiles. And her mama, she smiles at everyone, but there's a different way she smiles at her mama. And she starts cooing. <laughs> and you can just tell that there's something special that a kid has for the parent. We can take hold of God like that. At age four, you take hold of Abba, and, you, and, you, and, and they trust you implicitly. I still don't know why my kids would do that. They trusted me like implicitly at age four. And you know what happens when they're teenagers? <laughs> why are you laughing, brother? <laughs> your, your laugh stood out from everyone else's. And that's the way I laughed when I thought about it. Uh, they don't take hold of you the same way because they don't trust you as much. Now they question everything and all this stuff starts happening. But babies, little kids, it's Abba. And they utterly trust you. And we are being told this morning that the Spirit is causing us to cry, Abba. We can trust the Father the way an infant trusts his Abba. But all the days of our lives, because the more we learn of God, the deep in our trust grows because he's so trustworthy. And so Abba is what you've been looking for your, your whole life. And there's a way to be made uh, a son or daughter of God and it says, to those who received Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. And he will adopt you. First off, Jesus died for your sins. They can be washed away. He lived the life you should have, and God will treat you as if you lived that. And now he will bring you into that family. And you can say, Abba, Daddy. Are you hurt this morning because your parent wasn't perfect, absent, or abusive. Some are undone because you weren't that as a parent. Some won't even have children because you don't want to let them down the way a parent did. And the Spirit says that is, that is never what you truly needed. They're stand-ins and they're substitutes. I'm glad it's not Mother's Day or Father's Day. <laughs> You're just stand-ins. You're substitutes. This is the one that you've been looking for your whole life. Abba. And now you don't have a spirit of slavery, of fear, but sonship. And they're two completely different religions. Every religion is built on fear. And you've got to do things to appease God. And some of you sit here Sunday after Sunday still doing the same thing. I'm trying to be good and clean up my life to appease God. And the other is Jesus did everything to appease God, and now he's Abba. And I'm his daughter, his son, and I can dwell safely with God. I was thinking about the prodigal son. He comes to his dad. He says, you know what? I don't want you. I just want your inheritance. And again, and 
What a dad, man. He gives it to him. And he goes and he squanders it and blows it in riotous living. And then one day he, he wakes up in the pig slop and he finally comes to his senses and he repents. And, and he says, my father will never take me back as a son, but maybe I could just go back and be a servant. His servants have better things than I have here uh, in this mud. I'll go be a hired hand. I'm not going to live in the house, but I can live in the servant's quarters if he's gracious. And I can be in a, an employee to an employer. And it will be better than mud. And some of you are doing that this morning. I can never be a son again in the house, loved and cared for and protected in the tender affections of my father. And as he's walking home, he's practicing his speech. Okay, father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And he's just going through this whole thing. And he doesn't even get to say his speech. The father sees him from a distance and he does what no man would have done in the Middle East. He lifts his skirt up and he goes running after him and receives him, puts a ring on his finger, kills the fattened calf. Let's have a party. My son has returned. <clears throat> you are accepted and loved and adopted despite your performance, but by Jesus Christ's performance. And that happens nowhere in this world. Jesus, by his work, by the Holy Spirit making it real to us, you can now cry from the depth of your heart this morning, Abba. There's a dear lady in the church. It feels like she got saved yesterday because every day is a new day in Christ where she just smiles. And this week she said, I just can't get over that Jesus really died for me with this big old grin. And you know what that is? The Spirit just keeps making real to her what Jesus has really done. He really has died on a cross and you're forgiven and accepted in the family of God. This isn't a fable. And he gives you a spirit so you know it. And when you know it, you say, Abba. So how does the Spirit lead to put sin to death? Not with slavish fear. Not by going under law and I got to kill this sin or I'm going to go to hell. That isn't how he works. But you're under grace. Remember Romans 6, 14. Sin won't have dominion over you. You're not under law, but you're under grace. And so now under grace, what cries from deep within is Abba, Father. And this is how the Spirit's going to lead you. And then so many churches in our land have it wrong. And they, they stir up fear and control to get you what they want to do. And so, oh, what this would do to your life if you just had Abba, you would be putting all kinds of sins to death. Your anxieties, your insecurities, looking for other things, it's all coming out of this foundation. I need Abba. I need to know the new covenant that I am accepted by God and forgiven and adopted into his family. You get that, you're going to see love to God and love to others just brimming out of your life. This is how the Spirit of God works, not by fear, but by absolute joy of Abba. So the way we get rid of fear is Abba. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. Close out. Are you living right now making choices out of slavish fear? So you're just managing sin if you are. And everything's about fear. And that's what's driving all of your life. Or are you living out of the fullness of Abba that you're a child of God because that will put sin to death? And I just know in my little short time, I've had these couple breakthroughs in my spiritual life. And one was the Lord's Prayer. And I just could never get over when he said, teach us to pray. And he says, Abba. That, that now under this new covenant, I can actually come and say, Abba, not Yahweh. Abba. And then I had this season in Psalm 23 where man, I could just taste the nearness of God and the communion. And because he's my shepherd, I, I, don't, I don't want. I have everything because he's my shepherd. And then Romans 8. Romans 8, if you get this, you're just set free now to lose your life for God. All your fears that are holding you back are because you don't know Abba. You, you need that Abba. I feel crazy for Jesus. 
The more I get this, I, I, there's just nothing I don't want to do for him. Fear is driven out. John Piper said, This Abba is not by deduction from a fact, but by a delight in an event. And that event is the work of Jesus Christ. Romans is not a theological treatise, but it's my adoption paper signed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to go to the table now and look at how he signed it. And as you look at this table this morning, this is how you can cry Abba. He did everything necessary so that God could adopt you in the family. And so let's come together now and remember the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you. I thank you that all the times in life, fear, anxieties, things that come from within, I cry, Abba. I run to you. I look to you. I thank you that you've been inside of us. From the very inside now, we know we're sons and daughters of God. And I'm just asking for a million fears to be driven out of this church. So many fears sitting on us this morning. Let them look at this cross and see Jesus dying in our place. And let your spirit from the very core of their being with an irrepressible cry say, Abba, Father, comfort your people. I pray this morning by your spirit through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.